play and get some thoughts from you is breakdown to breakthrough. From first intifada to the White House law. So I want you to think about some quick first impressions that you might have, and then the framing that will give the discussion ultimately is the admissions of family drama. It's set at the height of the first intifada in 1988, and it can be seen as a, the tragic embodiment of the entire Israel-Palestine conflict in microcosm. Yet, a mere five years after the story that you've seen in Africa, um, new statements of mutual recognition between Israel and the PLO uh, were ratified on the White House lawn, and a path to peace seemed underway. Um, now, I'd just like to get, before our panelists talk about the play and our theme, some quick thoughts, if there's a, a, a phrase, a sentence or two of your responses to the play. Let's collect for a minute or two, three or four of those thoughts. Anyone in the audience? Can you just... Intractable. Intractable. <laughs> Other thoughts? Optimistic. Optimistic, okay. Need for healing. Everybody loses. Need for healing. Everybody loses. Angry. Everybody loses. Okay, that's a good start. <laughs> um, Dennis, in, in the decades that followed our play, you were a key actor in the negotiations between the parties. Um, your Israeli and Palestinian negotiating partners all carried with them their own histories, some personal entry points into living the conflict that, as we've seen it on stage tonight. Um, can you speak about how these personal histories might be a factor, might impact the cycles of breakthrough and subsequent, subsequent breakdown, which seem to be the ongoing going cycle of Middle East peace negotiations. Well, I, look, I, I think there's, I feel like there's a paradox here, because um, we just saw a play that sort of captures all the dilemmas, all the kind of hurts, um, the kind of contradictions between looking to the past and trying to you know, create a different future, not being the prisoner of the past, uh, and we're seeing some of this today when you see the debate over how you deal with the question of narratives. Um, but the reason I say paradox is because when I look at 1993, and I was dealing with both sides then, what I actually found at that time was a remarkable desire to look to the future, not to the past. Mm. In 1993, there was a sense that there was a new beginning. In 1993, there was, both sides were in a sense overwhelmed by what was a new reality. The new reality was an existential conflict, meaning two national movements competing for the same space who had engaged in what was a, an exercise of mutual denial had suddenly reversed that, and it had created this release. The level of potential, the sense of hopefulness, almost even enthusiasm, when I would get together with both sides, how they would get along would be extraordinary. And it was very much a function that you had a sense of a revolution taking place, and somehow it was able to diminish a lot of the hurts from the past. They didn't go away but there was a kind of different focus as a result. One of the things we face today is the past has come back. Mm. Because all of the, the, the kind of hopefulness, the sense of possibility, has been lost by 21 years mm. of a process that in the end, at this point, has yet to produce. And it creates a cynicism and a disbelief, and that disbelief conjures up again all the hurts all the sense of grievance, uh, and it's not that they were removed in 1993, but there was a sense of overwhelming possibility, uh, and had we been able to move much more quickly, then I suspect that we would have been able to find ways to reconcile the competing narratives, and that what we're doing today, in a strange, ironic way, we're back to trying to find ways of reconciling the two competing narratives. Wow. Yeah, you know, I think one of the things that was really remarkable about the negotiations that led to the 1993 Oslo Declaration is that 
the negotiators explicitly agreed in their talks to set history aside, that they were just going to agree not to talk about the past, not to argue about the past, but to look to the future. Um, and within the, the bubble of those secret negotiations, they were able to do that, they were able to move quickly, and they were able to accomplish something tremendous. Um, but of course, when you, as the play reveals, I think really well, when you get to the level of society, and people have to live with those compromises, then you can't escape the history. And so I, I, I agree very much with Dennis that the issue we're dealing with now is that the past has returned, but part of the reason the past has returned, it's in a sense inevitable, because the nature of the issues and the work that the negotiators have to do now demands that reckoning. And let me uh, <laughs> <laughs> what is. Uh, first of all, I mean, it's, it was really an amazingly acted, an amazingly constructed play. I mean, it, was, uh, it was a joy watching it. Uh, but uh, actually, it reminded me of uh, the Taba negotiations, the last negotiations under Barack. <coughs> it was my misfortune as a Palestinian negotiator to be tasked by my uh, bosses to go and negotiate with my Israeli counterpart a joint narrative of what happened in 1948. All right? We go to our room. We start, you know, we order our coffee, we start talking, so what is it for you? His name is Daniel, my counterpart. It's a great year, it was, you know, mistakes were done, yet uh, self-determination happened, etc., etc. The, the, the narrative that most of you would be familiar with. Then it came to our turn. What is 1948? We call it the Mecca era. Uh, it means the catastrophe. And we tried, we tried to find ways around this, and we realized it is not possible. It is not possible to agree on a narrative, it's not possible to negotiate history, and I have personally, out of that experience and subsequent thinking of that, have come to believe that important as it is to deal with these issues of history, you cannot deal with them through negotiations. And I'm very concerned when the issue of history and narrative comes back today as a negotiating issue. I think there's a need to sensitize, there's a need to understand, there's a need to understand that when one side recites their history, they don't do it out of malice, but out of conviction, Yet, I don't think we can negotiate them. I think one thing that I take from Oslo mm. and from other subsequent experiences is, despite all of the hurt, despite all of the negativity, despite the fact that the agreement in Oslo was opposed by many in the political classes, when people on the ground felt there was a real credible possibility for change, their lives are going to change. They were putting, willing to put aside history. They were willing to put aside many grievances because hope triumphed. And I think what we see right now, with the lack of hope, with the 21 years of failure, with all of that, suddenly history comes back because this is where you can hurt the other side. But I personally, I still have hope that if we end up with something credible that will give people a chance of, uh, or a real sense that there's a credible chance of change of their lives, I think many of these issues will be secondary in the public. You cannot ignore them. You have to deal with them. And I think the most painful one that I took from this play, the most painful part of dealing with them is not across the table but on your side of the table. But I think this is, I mean, this does not, I mean, when someone said the game of hope, I actually leave with a sense of hope that these are issues that are not as intractable. These are issues that will not necessarily preclude uh, us from making progress. Sure. So Rachel and I have a way of sort of meeting up with each other, so this is not a, we... They were together last night. <laughs> and we decided we're, we're doing a road show, so... <laughs> <laughs> I, I do think, I mean, I do think there is this possibility of, of hope trumpeting fear and memory. I can cite two examples that sort of give me this, this the sense of the possibility, and that what has to be created, recreated. If you recall at the time of the Madrid conference, Haider al Shafi was actually the one person who gave a statesmanlike speech. He was the head of the Palestinian This delegation. is 19, 1992, we're talking. 1991. Like what? Uh, and, um, you know, it was, uh, to put this in perspective, we had Farouk Oshara, who was a foreign minister of, of Syria. This was the Madrid Peace Conference, which sort of launched the, what word, negotiations, broke the taboo of negotiations. And in the spirit that we were trying to create, Farouk Oshara gets up there and he pulls out a picture of Yitzhak Shamir as a wanted terrorist during the mandate. This obviously was designed to create the mood. Well, <laughs> by comparison, Haider al Bushafi gets up and he gives a speech largely of reconciliation. Uh, 
uh, at the time, the sense of pride in his behavior was felt in both the West Bank and Gaza, and there were demonstrations where Palestinians went and gave out flowers to the idea. Fast forward to one month after uh, Camp David, the summer of 2000. Uh, and at that time, the, the concessions that Barack had been prepared to make, which he felt would sort of doom him if they came out when we were at Camp David, actually were received by the Israeli public as, okay. I mean, if you look before the Second Intifada breaks out, there was an acceptance. There basically was an acceptance. I actually recall having a dinner uh, one month after Camp David in Jerusalem <clears throat> with a number of members of the Likud at the time who were despairing because they said the public is ready to end this. And I cite the two examples because when there's a genuine sense of hope and a genuine sense of possibility, you put a lot of other things in perspective. It's when there's nothing but, a, but grievance to sort of compare with each other, then you focus only on the grievance. So I'm a little bit like Wraith that I think, even though I don't dismiss the fact that there are these deep-seated wounds, because I used to hear them all the time in the negotiations, it's also very possible to take a forward-looking view if you think there's a genuine sense of possibility. Our problem today is that both publics disbelieve, and so they don't focus on the sense of possibility. And even if right now it's possible to manage the period that we're in, if you don't begin to create a sense of possibility again, then the negotiations, even if they're sustained, are unlikely in the end to be productive. Before we go to the audience, I, I would just like to revisit, maybe as an example, and let it take us where it take us, takes us. The paradox that you talked about, um, that moment um, after Oslo, when, in a, in a sense, it was um, skipping over the step of trying to bring narratives together, there was an era of good feeling. I mean, it was palpable, and people 10 years later, at the height of the Intifada, remembered that 94, 95 times, people saying, I never believed it was possible, I never believed it was possible, and then with the gestures that were made, there was that feeling of possibility. Um, what, what made it go away, fundamentally? I mean, what, what was it? Was it the fault of the structure of the deal? Was it the outliers who went after it, or was it that there, it, it just was an era of good feeling that did not go deep enough into what was really there. Well, Dennis has written a whole book on this question. <laughs> <laughs> we'll probably be thinking of, uh, of uh, how to revise that answer um, for a long time to come. Uh, I, I will only say, I, I think there are a lot of elements. The gradualist structure of the Oslo process um, left room for spoilers to make trouble, and they did make trouble. Um, but there are certain things that I think we, we risk losing sight of at this moment when there is a lot of pessimism and a lot of skepticism. There are things about 1993 that stand that are crucially important. Um, and, and I think mutual recognition remains. Um, the signal achievement of the Oslo Declaration that changed forever the nature of the Arab-Israeli conflict uh, and the prospect for its resolution. And despite all the complications since, that, that remains unshaken. Um, all, the, all the discussion about Jewish state, uh, the PLO accepted the state of Israel and its right to exist, and that, that's fundamental. And Israel accepted the PLO as the representative of the Palestinian people, and, and that was and is fundamental. So I, you know, I, I think we can talk about structure and process and uh, and the uncertainties of, of history, but we have to remember what stands through that period and that we can build on. To continue in the same uh, vein, I mean, I'm looking at the audience and uh, many of you would remember when uh, talking about a two-state solution was a fantasy. But I actually remember, you know, during your uh, time, Clinton never, we knew you were going to work for a two-state solution, yet Clinton never uttered the word two-state solution. It took uh, George W. Bush to uh, 
Say the same with Barak. Actually, it took Sharon to say it. Now everyone believes in a two state solution. Yes, I'm not saying this is not a difficult moment, but I think I look it back at the Oslo, and it's easy in hindsight to look at all the things that were wrong with it. I often ask myself, if I was a negotiator then, given where the state of play at that point, could I have used something better? I simply do not know. There are many reasons why Oslo uh, went wrong. I think, personally, if I look back at it, it has nothing, or it doesn't, it's not fundamentally about the structure. <coughs> it was about leadership. I think what we lack there, and we still lack here, is the kind of leadership that takes this issue, owns it, and runs with it, and is leveling with its own public about uh, what it means to go there. I mean, I don't like to draw the analogy with South Africa. It always brings uh, kind of analogies that I'm not comfortable with. Yet, on one, on one front, I think South Africa was clear. Was, uh, was something we have to learn. When, at the, as they got close to signing the, to finishing the constitution, their peace deal, there was a very high profile killing of the number two of uh, in the ANC with the explicit objective of destroying the <coughs> negotiations. What happened? Mandela appears on TV, sends his people, his top people to the flashpoints to ensure that no one else defines it. At a very difficult moment, politically, there was a leader who stepped up and who owned it and who actually changed history. We did not have that. We actually ended up having, we reached that moment and we ended up having then uh, a degree of bartering and uh, looking for faults on the other side and magnifying what's wrong on the other side for tactical reasons that ultimately end up with a, with a strategic uh, vision that we are suffering from today. This lack of faith, not only in the possibility of the chance, this lack of faith in the other. And I think if there's one thing that uh, worries me about these days, there's one thing that I would be suggesting to Kerry these days, who I think, by the way, he's, he's done an amazing job in terms of managing the process, is be harder on the leaders. If the public looks at their leaders, and this is true of both, in my view, Abbas and Netanyahu, and say that these are leaders who are not willing to own this process, why would the public own it? And ultimately, so, in, so if you ask me what, I mean, it doesn't mean that we could have, you don't manufacture leaders, yet I think back in Oslo, if we had a more committed leadership, we might have ended uh, with, a, with a different uh, result. All of the flaws, uh, you know, notwithstanding. Yeah, look, I, of course, was there, so... Um, I think the fundamental problem with Oslo is that the, the two sides had completely different concepts of what it was about. Uh, Arafat thought it was a state waiting and we'd get it right away. Uh, Rabin thought the only way to produce this was by gradual step-by-step -step approach. Uh, some of this may have been a result of, I think, Abu Mazen and Abu Allah being convinced this was the way to go and kind of, in a sense, convincing Arafat of something that, in fact, wasn't what he really signed up to. So the early negotiations, when they, as soon as we began talking about the next steps, the two approaches were 180 degrees apart from each other. So there was this outside the deer that you'd had this enormous breakthrough, which Mars said is right, psychologically, because these were two national movements competing for the same space and they were each denying each other's existence, once you had a breakthrough on an existential basis, meaning there was mutual recognition, that seemed like you'd taken this enormous leap. But that was at 50,000 feet. And then, when they actually got to the table, their approaches at the table were fundamentally different. And we would come up with ingenious ways of bridging these differences. If you go back and you look at how we, the very first agreement we came up with and how we were going to happen and how we were going to deal with the border crossing. And so the, the Palestinians wouldn't see an Israeli, and yet the Israelis would still be able to control who was coming across. I mean, we had this brilliant notion of opaque glass behind which <laughs> Israelis would stand, the Palestinians wouldn't see them. And, and we had an Israeli director of the border crossing, and we had a Palestinian deputy director, and then they were going to swap after a period of time. The truth is, it showed a lot of ingenuity, and by the way, the ingenuity was reflecting something important. Even though there were these fundamentally different concepts, there was a, a, a powerful stake in wanting to make things work. Now, had we been able to move it along a little bit more quickly, then those who were opposed, and then you know, the, the, the suicide bombings were devastating. And, you know, I, I'll tell you, I, six months before Rabin was assassinated, you know, he said to me, who do you think is going to determine? We're sitting alone on a Shabbat afternoon in his apartment in Tel Aviv, and, and he says to me, who do you think is going to determine the next election? 
in Israel. So I try to prove how smart I am, and I go, Shas? <laughs> religious party, Orthodox, Sephardic religious party. Uh, and he goes, no. I guess again. I said, no, no, no. I'm not going to guess. Tell me. And he says, Hamas. He says, two suicide bombs, and I won't be the next prime minister. Mm. But, you know, we had to deal with what was, there were structural problems, but there were determined enemies of what we were doing as well. All right. Um, let's go to the audience. Um, if you have a question, please either speak very loudly or stand up. And if there is context to the question, keep the context as brief as you possibly can. Yes. You mentioned the case in South Africa, right, where there were two people they had to occupy the same land and both called it home, right? And they resolved that, or they threw it reasonably well at it, right? And they're doing it as one state, where people just have the rights to be themselves and to pursue their own religion. And why do we take this approach that two state is the only way Especially in our democracy, where Jew, Christian, whatever, doesn't matter. We thought the whole Middle East was a federal. In 1918, they had drawn the lines differently. Because it's not just Jews and, and, and Muslims who are suffering. The Middle, Middle Eastern Christians are suffering. You know, why can't, why can't there be a one-state solution where Jew, Arab, Christian, Muslim doesn't matter? Um... <laughs> Where do I start? Uh, <laughs> let me start with uh, 1916. Um, no, look, I mean, you are right. Many of these borders are artificial, reflect nothing, etc., etc. Yet, yet, I would say, how, how long now? 100 years later, uh, whatever. These have created real identities and real nationalisms, and there's something called Jordanian today, and something called Iraqi today, and something called Tunisian today. These are realities. And, you know, I, I, I sometimes think of. Uh, what Newt Gingrich said, Palestinians are a manufactured people. Of course they are. So is everyone else in that region. Mm -hmm. Yet this manufacture has become a reality. And I think this goes to, uh, you know, uh, to zoom to the Palestinians and the Israelis. The problem is not Muslim, Christian, Jew, what have you. The problem is, uh, or the issue is nationalism. And you have nationalism, nationalism that define how people identify themselves, how people identify themselves. And, you know, I wish we are in the post-nationalist, uh, post-modern uh, era. We are not. The nation-state is still the norm. And the political uh, uh, manifestation of nationalism is through self-determination, which happens through uh, statehood. As a Palestinian nationalist, at least that's where I uh, have come at it from in the beginning, I want to be in a country of my own, where my national identity is exercised where I define what color the flag is and what uh, the nature of what's my national anthem, etc., etc. This is something that is needed, I think, for the Palestinians for many reasons. One of the reasons being, frankly, and I think many Jews, will, many Zionists will uh, identify with this, frankly, when the Palestinians don't have a state of their own, when they are getting killed in Syria right now, they have nowhere to go to. When they were getting killed in Jordan, they had nowhere to go to. And so there is that kind of thing, but also at a more gut feeling, part of making sense of not only what happened in 1948 and Contour and all of these things, but all of the years that followed that, and all of the national movements, and all of the identity that developed after that, I don't see how it can be uh, developed outside a Palestinian state uh, that is Palestinian. Uh, there are many reasons. Uh, I'm not going to get into as in neither party wants it, as in uh, there are many disparities, as in there is a lot of grievances that will follow. You know, the, many of these can find technical solutions too, but I think at the core level of realizing your identity as a people, I just don't see any way but say for no, but I'll, so let me So let me answer that. Look at the rest of this region. The rest of the region, wherever you have any state, where there's more than one national identity within it, in the Middle East, they're basically at war with each other. So if you, if you want a prescription for enduring conflict, you talk about one state. I, I agree. <laughs> uh, sir, um, I'm aware of having a couple years ago been in, in Atlanta, and also... Could you speak 
coming. Uh, I may be going back to the Holy Land, and I was there a couple years ago doing a theater project. Um, I became acquainted with uh, two figures. One was Tayyip uh, Musebe, uh, who founded Al Quds University and is an outstanding intellectual Palestinian. Uh, has a lot of uh, Israeli contacts, some who are not so friendly to him, <laughs> wrong kind of contacts, and some are very supportive. And uh, and then there's uh, Abu Elish. You know he. Uh, and Yes, the doctor who lost three daughters and uh, and he gets in the in the uh, incursion into uh, uh, Gaza. Both of them have come up with this notion. They they floated the terms, not one state, but federation. Now this is interesting to me because I read the problem Question. of the sharing of the Palestinian aquifer. The majority of it right now goes to the Israel supposed to be involved somehow, but it's not. Right? So sharing water. When I was in Bethlehem, all the water dried up for several days. And so what did the young people do? They started stoning the municipal authorities <laughs> of the Palestinian authority. So you're so, asking about a, a federal solution to all this? Yes, Abu Elish thinks, he actually thinks that the two peoples have much in common in terms of culture, hot-headedness, all kinds of things. But uh, there are reasons that they need to be together to share water and to... Okay, I think we got it. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone want to take this up? I'm, I'm happy to start. I mean, I, I think maybe picking up from where Dennis left off, um, in some world, or maybe at some point down the line, after two states exist, when two peoples feel secure, it's not impossible, it's not inconceivable that you could have a, you know, a federal relationship. And in practice, of course you're right, natural resources, sanitation, economically, um, in myriad ways, these two populations are intimately intertwined and will remain so, whether they are in two states or one or, or something else. Um, but I think it is difficult to imagine getting from where we are today to that kind of solution, except through realization of these two nationalisms in two political entities. So I think you have to get to two states before you can even reach that phase. Uh, art. Uh, this this is a. Go ahead, Art, please. Okay. Yeah. This is a, 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 a quick Palestinian question. With, with the territories now divided into two totally separate governments and totally separate philosophies, how are they going to come together to act as the Palestinian state of the two-state solution? Short question. Uh, <laughs> um, there is no, I mean, you know, let me start with comparatively and then go to the Palestinian case. Comparatively, you have cases in the world where clearly geographical separation has uh, created unviability. You know, think about uh, Pakistan and Bangladesh, that's one example. There are other examples uh, where actually geographic uh, distance has made no difference. Uh, I look at Alaska. You might think what you want to think about the politicians from Alaska, but there's no one's questioning that that is, uh, you know, a working relation there. And there are many other <laughs> uh, So I think in many ways, what, uh, I mean, there are two answers to your question, three answers. The most easy one would be the logistical. In negotiations, we have always assumed that we've always, uh, everyone agreed that Israelis and the Palestinians and the Americans, there will be some sort of uh, passage connecting the two territories. So that is not something that is that difficult, and that's why we paid engineers to come up with creative ideas of tunnels and bridges and what have you. That's one side. Another side of it would be, I would say today, no Palestinian leader, based on, again, the way that Palestinian nationalism has developed, can ever sign a deal that will not have the two sides to uh, Gaza and the West Bank uh, and East Jerusalem as part of the deal. They just can't. Uh, Hamas right now, I have no doubt, would love to have the Emirates in Gaza and say, this is ours. <laughs> can't happen. The third and really the real question, though, the real answer from my perspective is, the answer to the question happens after the uh, Palestinian state is created. 
if you have a Palestinian leadership that uh, a Palestinian government that can create a sense of public identification where the public actually think, you know what, we actually want to be with this government, one that's not corrupt, one that is, uh, meets their expectations, etc. I suspect there will be enough reason to uh, keep the two sides together. And I would even go a bit further, building on what <coughs> you just said. I even see as a future where not only Palestine, Israel, which have, whether it's federal, whether it's confederal, whether it's some sort of, but I can see Jordan being part of that as well. But that depends on how things develop domestically in Palestine. I think this is something that the Palestinians will have to uh, reach, having felt that this is their decision, not one of both. I was going to make a comment rather than ask a question based on the gentleman back here. There, nationalism is one thing, but when you're talking about the Israeli nationalism, the Palestinian nationalism, we're forgetting something. There's the religious piece. There used to be Jews in all the Arab countries. Can you imagine a Jew in any of the governments in any of the Arab countries, let alone living in any of them today? We have Arabs in the Israeli Knesset. Can you imagine a Jew in a government in Palestine? I mean, there is not just a nationalistic issue. There's also religious tolerance as an issue. And I know there's an organization called the Arab Institute that deals with water issues between the Palestinian and the Arab countries and Israel. The Arab kids who go to the program at Araba are taking their lives in their hands by going to this program in Israel. And they only come from Jordan and I think occasionally other Arab countries where they're living in Jordan but they're from somewhere else and maybe some Israeli-Palestinians, but it... There are some from the West Bank as yeah, West Bank I mean, as well. This is, this yeah. is not just an issue of nationalism, it's also an issue of religious tolerance and acceptance. I mean, look, again, there are many ways I would react to this. One being, uh, actually, the one exception to what you said, being Morocco, where actually there is a very thriving Jewish community, which is very... Um, uh, By the way, Jewish ministers. Yeah, right? including ministers. Okay. It's including an exception. Yeah. It also um, tourism. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 I mean, look, uh, to me, to be honest, this is neither here nor there. I mean, uh, one thing that I think often... I, I find myself often even uh, being upset with the term peace, because that's not even what I'm talking about. I think sometimes when we, when we imagine peace or whatever it is that we imagine, we imagine this world of kumbaya and perfectness and what have you. No, 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 that's not what I want. What I want, you know, what Palestine is in the future is my concern. I have my own vision of Palestine, which, uh, you know, it's a liberal, it's a progressive one, what have you, and there are others who have different visions between the Hamas and those who want to create another Tunisia or another Egypt. But this is our problem at the end of the day. At the end of the day, when this country, say, has a relation with Saudi Arabia, we have our views and our issues about, you know, they're not religiously tolerant, to put it uh, mildly. Um, yeah, this doesn't change the fact that you need these two, uh, these, these uh, political constructs. What they look like is something that uh, is for me uh, to deal with, and by the way, Give me a peace deal that uh, I can be proud of and I can own. It will make my chances of pushing my what I believe in in my own community much bigger than when Hamas can claim that terrorism and violence is giving uh, is producing more results than diplomacy and than uh, moderation. So there are many ills in the region. Yet let's not make the perfect the enemy of the good. Let's not look frankly. I mean, uh, let's not look at what we're going to come up with with this uh, negotiation as a marriage in which we have to love one another. It's a divorce. It's good if we can be friends afterwards, but I can live with it if we're not friends. I challenge, I mean, I, I'm hard pressed to find a single Egyptian who likes Israelis, yet I have no issue with the peace process, with the peace treaty between Egypt and uh, Israel. And that is always my stand, of course. Is there a question or two that would like to bring it back to the play? <laughs> <laughs> Sir. The future. Five years from today, where do you see the process? <laughs> <laughs> Let's get another question. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're taking that under, that's been taken under advisement. We're taking that under advisement. But let's hear another question or two as we begin, as we begin to wrap up. 
On the side. Right. Okay, yes, yes. Um, the dialogue in which there was seemed to be some acceptance or exposure of the Palestinian narrative, um, there's also this Ari Shadid book that's uh -huh. just appeared, which is also uh, given prominence to the Palestinian narrative. I mean, what is, why, what's happening? Um, is this something that's just the kernel of Israeli society? Is this a more broad-based thing? And what are the implications of it for the peace process or for whatever? Look, I, I don't think it's broad-based. Can you repeat the question? The, the question was, uh, it's, it's not really so much the Palestinian narrative. There is, there is a, um, the question was about this, in a sense, what we saw in the play. There, the desire of some in Israel to, to be honest and open about the past as a way of, in a sense, being able to really define a different future. Uh, Ari Shabit's book, My Promised Land, he deals with Lydia, and he's come under some criticism about the way he's described Lydia, and in a sense, you kind of got a flavor of it in the play. What I thought was really good about the play was the effort to try to create a, a context, okay, people who were killed the day before, uh, you know, the, the young kids who basically are, are in an impossible situation, orders that sort of say, look, we can't, this is an area where if, if there's a strong air presence, it's going to make it difficult to have a coherent Jewish state. Um, there is an impulse, in his case, I think, um, he, he feels that Israel can fully flower when it's completely honest with itself. And that represents a view that some in Israel have, but I wouldn't, if you ask me, is it the mainstream? No, and I wouldn't say, look, understand, this is a book that was written in English first. <laughs> it hasn't occurred in Israel yet. I'm sure they've read it. No. Well, no. don't be so sure. <laughs> um, but it's what he wrote is not new. You had Benny Morris, you had, you had a whole group of Israeli historians going back about maybe 15 years ago who were writing about this and, and exposing what went on during the war. You know, the fact is, it was a war. Uh, and 1% of the Jewish population in Israel was killed in that war. 6,000 dead out of 600,000. So, you know, it's the Israeli War of Independence, as, as Reis was talking about when they referred to it, it's the Nakba, it was a catastrophe. And in, in some respects, it gets back to this question that Grace was talking about, the more you focus on the past, does it make it easier for each side to free themselves of it? And I think what, he, what Grace is raising is, he has his own doubts. Uh, and I have to say, from a, from a negotiator's standpoint, uh, I often felt that if we were going to sort of fight history, we would never really have a chance to deal with the future. Uh, and there has to be a way to acknowledge certain things. But there also has to be a way not to be, become so much the prisoner of the past that you're paralyzed and you can't do anything about the future. Um, you know, I, I, I think those are, those are fantastic points. I guess I would also say that there are things politicians and negotiators can deal with well, and there are things they can't. Um, and reckoning, helping a society come to grips with its own history and reconcile itself to its, sorry, and, and reconcile itself to its own history, that's something other parts of society do better, I think, than politicians and negotiators. I was really struck, I wrote down these, this, these paired lines of dialogue in the play. Giora at one point says, only when we find out what happened there will we be able to live here. And later on in the play, his father, Abigdor, says, if we learn to live here, these open wounds will scar and heal. And there's clearly in the, in, the, in the play, there's this generational divide about how to deal with history. But I think it's actually, it's not just generational. In Israel or in Palestine, it's, it's across the generations, this argument about how to deal with history. But as Venk was saying earlier, it's within each of these societies as much as between them, maybe even more than between them. And, to me, this just points up, and getting back to some of the, the questions that were raised earlier, whatever negotiators do and whatever uh, formal agreements are reached, you know, you can get a divorce. Um, but what makes it a, a viable divorce, a good divorce, 
is what else happens. The societal reconciliation, the mechanisms, the, the resilience within these societies, the ability to manage disputes, the ability to teach kids to manage the tension of you know, their communal identities and the histories of their communities. And that's not something politicians and negotiators can do. Just, yeah, I mean, the, the one, actually, the line that I wrote down from the play was when Ibrahim was saying, you know, what, the dead will come back to life. At some point, this is something to kind of keep in mind. Just to kind of build on what you just said. I mean, that's why I believe the issue of history and narrative should not be that. You said negotiators and politicians were not good at that. But also negotiations as a format, which presupposes compromise. Everything you put on the negotiating table, you put to compromise. I'm not sure that this works with identity and with uh, history. And that's why what you need, in my view, is a parallel process, a different process. Maybe it's a subsequent process, I don't know. Where it is not about agreement, it's not about compromise, it's about exposure, and it's not led by uh, lawyers, basically. I agree with that. I do think there comes a point where, in a sense, each side has to, to say, we respect your narrative. We don't ask you to deny your narrative. But now it's time to sort of build it for the future. And we're not going to be we're not going to be consumed by the narratives, even as we recognize and respect them. But I just just not to let your five-year question go uh, unaddressed. I would answer it in two ways. Uh, a friend of mine, I'm plagiarizing him now, says. Uh, no one has gone poor betting uh, against success in the Middle East uh, peace <laughs> process. So if you want to take the odds, then uh, we will have more of what we have now. Yes, yes. That aside, uh, most of the breakthroughs, all of the breakthroughs probably came at a time when we never expected them because there was a moment, a window of opportunity. There was someone there who was ready to, ready to pounce on it and use it. And I think as we look at the process today and what's happening today and what's going to be happening in the coming months, We'll see enough, at least, if not reason to be depressed, then no real reason to be, you know, dancing for joy. Yeah, I think the biggest mistake that any of us, at least those of us who do work this uh, professionally and who are engaged in it, is to give up. Because if we give up, there will come that moment and there'll be no one who will be there to pounce on it. And you can be sure, as you said about the Hamas thing, those who are against progress will always be motivated by the slightest sign of progress. Often those of us who are for progress for getting along, for what have you, we just shrug and let it pass. And so what happens in five years' time depends a lot on what those of us, whether here, whether there, how committed and how active we remain, and how to allow cynicism to define how we see these processes. I look at what Kerry is doing, and I find myself sometimes cynical. Yeah, but I ask myself, what's the point? So this goes back to the five years. You know, ask me to bet, I bet it's not going to change. Does it mean that I'm going to quit and go open a some boutique store somewhere? Not yet. I'm not there. <laughs> uh, we've reached our 45 minutes. Going uh, back and forth between the Palestinian areas and Israel, you, you see the, the desire, the lack of trust, and the desire for divorces there. But, you know, the mutual recognition which came is also built on in a hundred years of conflict, they know each other and they know the other is not going away.